other and uh, be messengers for you because so many people just need a little bit of cheering up. Well, some of them need a lot of cheering up, but we try and we just pray for them and we pray for all the hearts to come together and serve you and love you and, and know that you're taking care of us and you're going to get us through everything and we're going to be fine and we're always fine because we know you're almighty God and you can fix all our problems you're mightier than anything that comes against us we love you thank you Jesus amen amen okay um so tonight we're, we're taking a um we're deviating from our normal lesson um from where we were when we were looking at the plan of humanity and we're going to be looking at uh the incarnation will be in john chapter one the gospel john chapter one and it's how god's purpose um in the uh incarnation uh was to reveal himself through christ and tonight we're going to be um so we're going to be looking at an event that was prophesied by the prophet Isaiah. It was about 700 years ago before it occurred. And it's going to be found in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And you know I read out of the NIV. And it says that the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Okay, that's Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. The son of God, Jesus, he was going to live among his people for 33 years, but we know that his kingdom is going to be eternal. Now, Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called. I want you to listen to these names, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And continuing on in verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. That's what Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 states. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a quote, and it's from Walter A. Meyer. He's a speaker that was on the Lutheran Hour radio station. And here is what he has to say, and I quote, He, Isaiah, identifies this Christmas child by these five glorious names. And I asked you to really listen to what those names were now when I counted them I only came up with four but I see what he did he took wonderful meaning one name he took counselor as another or we could just say wonderful counselor he's the mighty God the everlasting father and the prince of peace and he's he is all he was or will be or he is all of these things. I was reading my devotional today. I read our daily bread every day. And in today's devotional, it just happened to be on that verse, Isaiah chapter nine, verse two to seven. And it said in there, which of his titles from Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, means the most to you this season and then that they asked why i don't give you homework in this lesson that i teach from but i'm going to ask each one of you to take this verse where it says he's called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father and prince of peace and I want you to be like Mary, the mother of God, how she pondered these things in her heart. And I want you to look at, study them throughout this week, next week, maybe even throughout the coming new year. 
And I want to ask you, which of these titles mean the most to you and why? I don't want to know. We're not going to discuss it. This is between you and God. Study his names and then seek his face and ask him and tell him which one of those names mean the most to you. And it could be all of those names. Now, the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they tell the story of Jesus' birth through two different perspectives, okay? And Matthew, Matthew, he focuses on the event from the perspective of Joseph. Luke, he relates Mary's perspective. And Mark, he, his begins with the narrative with John the Baptist's introduction of the Messiah, who's Jesus. And we're going to be, like I said, in the book of John. And his gospel offers a different perspective. He's going to focus on Jesus as the eternal word. And when I say word throughout this lesson, it begins with the capital W, the eternal word of God sent from the Father. Now, it's very easy in this time of year, because everybody's so busy, that we, lose, we could lose focus on what the reason, why do Christians celebrate this season? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Well, we all know what that is. The reason is, is the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, God's purpose in the incarnation was to <laughs> reveal himself through Jesus Christ. I'm going to remind you, give you a refresh of what the word incarnation means. And I took it out of my textbook from school. And it says it means the act by which the eternal son of God, which is Jesus, he became a human being without giving up his deity. So the son of God, which is Jesus, he became the son of man to reveal to uh, people the knowledge of God that leads to salvation and everlasting life or eternal life. We're gonna now look at the eternal word and it begins again with the letter W. We're gonna look at John chapter one verses one and two now some people who don't believe in the bible they'll they'll admit and they might still admit that there was a man named jesus and he was born near the beginning of the century the first century and that he offered good teachings that were going to help people live better lives and yeah that's kind of true but jesus didn't begin to exist when he came into the world and we know that, that he was and is eternally existed. He was with the Father, Father God in creation. He came to earth to redeem humanity and he will still be with the Father at the end of time. So here we know that he's always with us, never gonna leave us and never gonna forsake us as the scripture says. Revelation chapter 22 verses 12 and 13 says, Behold, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. Verse 13, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I'm also going to read uh, from Revelation chapter 22, I'm gonna read verse 16 and it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star. John's gospel is often referred to as the gospel of belief. It was written partly because, see, there was these wrong beliefs that were going on in the first century. And that gospel, it, it, it still serves that purpose today to correct any wrong beliefs. John chapter 20, verse 31 says, But these are written that you may believe 
that Jesus is the Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. And that by believing, you may have life in his name. I already mentioned that the Apostle John wrote the gospel to some extent to correct some incorrect teachings about Jesus, who he is, and why he came. And Jesus understood that if you're going to deny the truth of who Jesus is, then you're going to deny the power of the gospel. So accepting that Jesus is who he said he is, it forms the foundation of the message that sets us free from sin so that we could receive eternal life. Now, one of the errors that was creeping uh, into the churches in John's time was the denial, okay? They denied that Jesus is, always has been, and always will be God, which I kind of mentioned before. So John's opening remarks in his Gospel of John, it disproves this false teaching. If you look at verse 1, so we're going to be looking at John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we can see from this verse that when the universe began, Jesus was there. And he's the second person of the Trinity. So he was there with God the Father and God the Spirit before the work of creation began. And to make it absolutely clear that Jesus is God, John added something in verse 1. And that says, the word was God. So John's opening words describe Jesus as the word again with a capital W. What's clear is that Jesus is the way God chose to reveal himself and communicate his message and his will. And you can find that in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, uh, proves insight into this when he says, and we studied this last week, when he said that Jesus is the exact representation of his being. And I'll refresh your memory on that scripture. Hebrews chapter one, verse three says that the sun is, and that's S-O-N, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And uh, the King James version says the express image of his God's person. So Jesus spoke of how he reveals the nature of God the Father by his words and his actions because he is, and we all know this, he's one with the Father. You could find that in John chapter 5, verse 19. We're still in John chapter 1, verse 2. It says he was with God in the beginning. So John, he wants to make it sure that he's clear in his declaration that Jesus is eternally God. He's emphasizing that Jesus, as the scripture says, was with God and that he existed before creation and that contrary to these false teachings of about him. Jesus isn't just one God with a little g. He's not just one God among many. And it's, it's not accurate to say that Jesus is like God, okay? You can't say that, that Jesus is like God. Why? Because the truth is that Jesus is God. He's, in, he's one in nature or essence with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. And John, he's going to reveal shortly, and we'll see it, that what makes this truth so vital is that Jesus is the Word, again, with the capital W, made flesh. Again, he's God incarnate, through whom people may receive grace and truth, and we'll see that in verse 14. 
Now we're going to look at how Jesus is creator of all things. And we're going to be in verses three to five. Now, Jesus isn't, he's not, isn't part of God's creation. He's fully God. He has no beginning and he has no end. So he was intimately involved in creation. And when God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, that's in Genesis chapter one, verse 26. This demonstrates the totality of the, of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit is also mentioned specifically in Genesis chapter, uh, in Genesis chapter one, verse two. Now God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the one true God has always existed and will always exist. And I know I sound repetitive, but this is what John is trying to get everybody to see. He wants to make sure that you know this. And in verse three, it says, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that he has been. So Jesus is God, he's eternal, he's the creator of all things. And the phrase in the beginning in verses one and two, they're crucial. Why? You remember where that came from? It comes from Genesis. And Genesis opens up with the same phrase in declaring uh, that God created the heavens and the earth. It's in Genesis chapter one, verse one. So not only was Jesus there in the beginning with God, Jesus is in fact the one with a capital O, the one who made all things. There's no doubt is left here, okay? Jesus is the creator and he's not a created entity, okay? As some in John's days, they were wrongly teaching. And in verse four, it says, in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. So as the creator, Jesus is the source of life. And this includes not only biological life, such as plants and animals and humans that were formed at creation, but also um, uh, spiritual and eternal life. And in verse five, it says, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. So closely related to Jesus being the source of life, that he's also the source of light. And here in, in this uh, verse is the most, uh, is in most references to light in John's gospel. Light is determined and is defined rather in terms of spiritual enlightenment. And so what people know about God, where does it come from? It comes through Jesus. Why, who is Jesus? He is the light with a capital L. He's the light of the world. And the, night, the light of the knowledge of God, it shines into the darkness of the condition of people that are very sinful. And you know, a lot of people, they might not take hold of that enlightenment they might not believe it they might even reject it but there's one thing we could always remember the darkness can never ever overcome it now we're going to be looking at the true light don't you like that manger look at that manger oh i like it Pretty, huh we're going to be looking at the true light again light with the capital l John the Baptist, when he was born, he had a clear purpose. We all know what that purpose was. It was to point people to Jesus and he fulfilled that purpose. He did a really good job at it. Great crowds of people, they came and they heard him, they repented and they were baptized, okay? And then just at the right time, he bore witness as the scripture says, witness to the light. And that's in verse eight when he said in verse 29 look the lamb of god who takes away the sins the sin of the world so once the apostle john he established which we just went through he established the true nature of jesus christ as god he moves forward with the account of jesus christ and that account was that jesus 
as the word again with capital w he uh he was the word made flesh he came into the world as the light again with a capital l of the world and the story of jesus it begins before his birth there was another miraculous birth and it was that of john the baptist john what do we know about John the Baptist? Well, he was the only child and he was the, of an older couple. His mother, she'd been barren for a long time before God intervened. And in chapter, we're in John chapter one, we're gonna be looking at verses six to eight. There came a man who was set from God. His name was John. So God called John and he told him he was gonna be the forerunner of the Messiah who is Jesus. And in verse seven, it says, he came as a witness to testify concerning the light so that through him all might believe. Now, John's ministry was to bear witness of Jesus as the Messiah, the light who uh, reveals to the world who Jesus is. So why? So that they might believe. John's gospel is clear that the ministry of John the Baptist was to point people to faith in Jesus. Now, there are some statements of John the Baptist that are recorded in John's gospel, and it brings this out very clearly, that the ministry of John the Baptist was to point people to faith in Jesus, uh, in, in the anointed one that was coming. And John the Baptist, he describes himself. How does he describe himself? We all know, what did he say? He was a voice of the of one and the wilderness that prepared the way for the lord's coming and john declared that uh, jesus he said that jesus is the lamb of god that jesus was the son of god you can find that in verses 15 to 36 and in verse 8 it says he himself was not the light he came only as a witness to the light so john was the one who bore witness to the light uh, which is the messiah but he wasn't the light himself only jesus the light with a capital l and the word with a capital w could bring spiritual illumination to the hearts of the people so we're now we're going to look at uh, John uh, verses 9 to 13 and that's about how Jesus came into the world we all know this that when sin entered the world through the disobedience of Adam and Eve mankind's relationship with the creator it was broken and there had to be a reconciliation and it could only come through mm. a perfect sinless sacrifice and that was jesus christ and he came as the light he was the one who could bring people out of darkness he was the one that could bring people into a right relationship with god and in verse 9 it says the true light that gives a light to everyone was coming into the world so john in this gospel he's continuing by speaking further about jesus's role as the light of the world and that how jesus came into the world um he created to re he he came into the world that he had created to reveal the father to people and in verse 10 it says he was in the world and though the world was made through him the world did not recognize him so we see here there's a tragedy most people they didn't recognize who jesus who didn't recognize jesus for who he was and then even more tragic than that is that his own people they didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, even though there was many promises and prophecies about this in the Old Testament. And in verse 11, it says, he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So as a result, many of his own people, they failed to receive him. But obviously not all of the Jewish people rejected Jesus as the Messiah. How do we know that? Well, John's gospel, he shares stories of many who did put their faith in Jesus. For example, we got Nicodemus in chapter three. We got a blind man that was healed in chapter nine. We got Mary and Martha. Remember all these people? Mary and Martha, she was in, in chapter 11. And then we got all the original uh, disciples except Judas. 
Yet many that were among the Jewish leadership, they regarded Jesus to be a threat. Imagine that. He was such a good man. He went about doing his father's business and the people looked at him as a threat. So we see that there was opposition of the Jewish leaders. Then you have the corruption of the human nature. And what did this lead to? It led to many of the Jewish people rejecting Jesus as the promised Messiah. Now there's a contrast between rejecting Jesus or receiving him. And it's kind of dramatic, okay? I want you to look at it. It's in verses 12 and 13. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. We all know that when we have faith in Jesus Christ, it's going to result in a new birth and we're going to become a child of God. And how is this done? It's the work of God and God alone. Salvation, it's not the result of anything that people have to offer. We've been through this before. Salvation isn't, doesn't come by anything you can do. We all know that all of our good works aren't gonna save us. What is it then? It's a matter of choosing. Are we gonna believe the word and are we gonna follow Jesus? And if we're gonna believe, there's gonna be an act of commitment that has to take part on an individual. Okay, when you're born again, that's what happens to an individual as a result of the saving and redeeming act action that's taken on by God. Now we're gonna be looking at, so we see that Jesus went in our last slide, he went from the manger to now look at him, he's on, the cross. So he's going from the manger to the cross, but we all know he doesn't stay there. We're going to be in John verse 14. When we think of the glory of the pre-existing son of God, he's the second person in the Trinity. It's kind of difficult to imagine. Why was he willing to give up the glory of heaven? Why was he willing to give up that glory of heaven to live for 33 years on this earth among people that were very sinful? And it's even more amazing that he willingly suffered a horrible, cruel death to bring reconciliation between people that were disobedient and almighty God. Why, why did he do that? Jesus, whom John referred to as the word, again with the W, capital W, he came into the world he created as a human being. And in John in verses one and verse 14, the word, word with a capital W, emphasizes Jesus Christ as being the, and I quote, person, end of quote, of God in all his wisdom and power. And this includes his sovereign power and wisdom as creator. And as that, we're reminded of another beginning where God spoke in his wisdom and power and the universe came into being. And we saw that in Genesis. Now we're in John chapter one. We're still there. We're not going to leave chapter one. We're in verse 14. And it says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son. King James Version says, only begotten who came from the father, full of grace and truth. 
Now, in the term word with a capital W, we find insight how it, as we read John's proclamation that Jesus is again, he's the word made flesh. And so for God to take on flesh, for God to take on flesh was the ultimate expression of divine love, mercy, and compassion for a human race that was hopelessly lost in sin. And so Jesus came to the earth so that people might not perish because of their sins, but instead that they would receive true life that is full and eternal. John 10.10, 10. you all know that verse, but sometimes it's misquoted, okay? It says the thief comes only to steal. Sometimes people, like I said, that they misquote that. They say it comes to kill, to steal. No, the thief comes, what does he do first? He comes to steal. And then what does he do? He comes to kill and then he destroys but what does jesus say what does he says he says i have come that they might have life and have it to the full so as an eyewitness of the life of jesus the apostle john he could testify how jesus's glory was displayed through signs and miracles that he did and you can find that in john chapter 2 verse 11 and even though there were glimpses of his glory jesus humbly set the fullness of his glory aside when he came to dwell among his people he set his glory aside so rather than come to this earth in his full majesty jesus what did he do he came to serve his humble obedience to the will of the father what did it lead to i just showed you in that that slide it led to the cross where he became the atoning sacrifice for the sins of all the people and as verse as verse 14 said the one and only son or the only begotten jesus is uniquely the son of god so he was is and always will be god and by his coming to live on earth and his humble obedience to the will of the father jesus made the way for people to be born again as god's children by faith and the unmerited favor and knowledge of god it came through and it comes through jesus so believers we need to express our gratitude that jesus is full of grace and truth now we're going to be looking at how jesus brought grace and it's in john chapter uh, it's in verses 15 to 18 and we we know that it's only through the grace that's brought to people through jesus that we can have peace with god now think of the grace it took for god himself remember god himself he took on flesh he stepped into a lost world he faced temptation he faced rejection and then death why for the purpose of setting us free from sin ephesians 2 chapter uh, ephesians 2 verses 6 to 8 reminds us that god expressed his grace to us through kindness by giving his son jesus christ and it's only through this grace that we are saved john verse 15 and 16 says john testifies concerning him he cries out saying this was he of whom i said he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me from the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another in verse 16 when it talks about of his fullness it looks back if you look back at verse 14 that Jesus is, what does scripture say? He's full of grace and truth. So we as believers, we receive grace out of the fullness of the grace that's found in Jesus. 
and the blessings received by grace lead to even more blessings. Aren't you glad about that? He gives us so many blessings if we just stop and think about it. And in verse 17, it says, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, verse 18. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side has made him know. So the full expression of grace and truth, where does it come from? The scripture says only through Jesus Christ. And it's true that, yeah, God has already shown grace and truth to people, particularly in the law of Moses, through Jesus, the favor and knowledge of God finds expression, ultimate of knowledge of God finds ultimate expression. The sacrifices for sin prescribed in the law foreshadowed the grace Jesus' once for all sacrifice provides. The law also revealed truth about God. Jesus Christ is as Colossians chapter one Verse 15 says, he's the image of the invisible God. Hebrews chapter one, verse three. Again, we're gonna go over that. He's the express image of his person. And so these scriptures makes the truth about the nature of God more clearly known. Moses revealed what was shown to him. Jesus revealed what was known by him. So what is God saying to us in this study? He's saying that Jesus Christ is truly the reason for the season that we celebrate as Christmas. And because Jesus came, people can know God and then we could have a genuine relationship with him. And it's reflected in a life of faith and so that we can receive eternal life. So this study then that I just taught you, it's more than a Christmas study. It reminds us that we as Christians, we need to be centered on Jesus Christ of Nazareth every day of the year. We went through all the different uh, things that Jesus is. We looked at how he's the eternal word. He was there in the beginning. We looked at how he's the creator, that he's the source of life, that he's the true light reveals who God is and what he does. He's the one who made it possible for people to be born again as children of God. And it's through Jesus that this world receives grace and truth. So being a Christian, it's all about Jesus. It's not about us. It's believing in him. It's being conformed in his image so that it is really and truly he that lives in us. It's no longer we that live, but it's Christ Jesus who lives in us. So let's not let anything, not even celebrating Christian Christmas, take our focus off of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's remember who he is, what he's done. He was born as a baby in a manger. Don't leave him in the manger. He went and he suffered and died on the cross. He spilled his blood for us. Don't leave him on the cross. Take him off. Put him in your heart. Let his blood, the blood of Jesus, be upon you each and every day. Remember what he's done. Don't get caught up. Who gave you what? Who sent you a card? Who didn't? It's not about us. It's about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's about Jesus Christ of Nazareth and what he's done for each and every one of us. I pray that each one of you 
have a blessed Christmas, that the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be upon each one of you, and that you remember that it's because of Jesus that we're alive today, that we even partake of this study. May he be with you, remember who he is, and remember to ponder who he is to you, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace, Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.